Okay, turf grass, weed problems. A very important point to remember, and this will be on your test, is integrated pest management. Remember back when Randy was talking about integrated pest management? He talked about put all the pieces of the puzzle together to control the pest problem. He didn't say just spray and pray. He didn't say just fertilize or just water. He said do all the cultural practices. Look at all the things that are involved with managing pest problems. That's what IPM is. And you use IPM in controlling weeds and turf. And notice herbicides is next. Herbicides wasn't first. It was down the list. Of course, we'll discuss herbicide failure because somebody back at your shop may not mix it properly, may not spray it properly. Almost always, herbicide failure is due to applicator's error, either in mixing or application. And you know what? Identifying the weeds. If you don't use the right herbicide for the weeds, you may not get control, and you may cause collateral damage to boot. All right, let's talk about weeds. What are weeds? Basically, they're simply a plant out of place. A rose bush in a cornfield would be considered a weed. A clump of fescue in a Bermuda lawn would be considered a weed. Your first line of defense in any weed control program, in turf particularly, is a good healthy stand of turf. You have a healthy lawn, it's going to go a long ways to out-competing weed problems that would try to develop. Use the right turf grass variety for your situation. Would you typically put Bermuda in semi-shade or shade? No, because it would die an agonizing death. Point being is put the right turf grass in, the right, in that situation and it will typically grow better and compete with the weeds. Fertilize to the advantage of the desirable plant material, whether we're talking about ornamentals or turf. Why in the world would you apply fertilizer to a Bermuda lawn in January? or February. You shouldn't because the Bermuda would not utilize it efficiently. Now fescue could utilize the fertilizer in February but we wouldn't be applying it on Bermuda. Dethatch. Steve and Todd both talked about dethatching lawns. Mow at the right height and the right frequency. Just simply mowing a lawn goes a long ways to reducing weed problems because how do a lot of weeds reproduce? Most weeds reproduce through forming a seed head and then those seed mature, and then they come back and haunt you later. So if you keep it mowed, you reduce a lot of the potential for producing seed. Water infrequently and deeply. Now you all know this, but do all your clients do this? Not necessarily. But if you can help educate your clients to water deeply and infrequently, you reduce disease problems, you reduce your insect problems, and you have, typically, you have a healthier turf that's more stress resistant, more stress tolerant. Of course, manage the disease in insects so that your, your turf stays healthy. Put all this together and you, you're doing what are called cultural practices. Water properly, fertilize properly, mow properly, and put the right plant in the right location. All those are considered cultural practices. Integrated pest management and weed control. Of course, regardless of where we're talking about on the test, you're probably going to hear something related to preventing the problem. If you prevent the problem to begin with, you don't have to worry about what to spray and when to spray it. Look at the source of weeds. Where Are you bringing them in? We'll talk about that in a second. Because you could be the one. If you're going to an infested account and doing the mowing and edging, et cetera, and then you take that equipment over to a fairly clean account, you could be bringing the weed problems to, your, to the second account. Clean your equipment off. Avoid bringing it from one location to the other. Okay, wind and water. We can't control the rain that might be moving some weed seed off of another area onto your property. We can't control the wind from blowing some weed seed over. So those sources we just have to deal with. And of course, wildlife. Birds, of course, love to pick up seed and bring it over to a new location. We just have to deal with those. But you do have control over your sod source, your seed source, your sprigs, 
You have control over where you're getting topsoil and soil amendments from so that you can reduce the potential of bringing in weed problems. Even the container stock and flowers that you bring into a location, be sure that they're weed free. Very important. You remember Randy saying that a few times? Very important. You will see this again. Selective herbicides versus non-selective. If you identify the weed and you identify the desirable plant material in that location, then oftentimes you can select a herbicide that will control the weed and not damage the desirable plant material in that location. In this case, we're talking about turf grass, but it could be ornamentals. Identify the weed, identify the desirable plant material, then you often can select a herbicide to control the weed. Non-selected would be you spray it, you kill it. Whether you want it to just kill the weed and, and you sacrifice some of the desirable plant material, you just spray it all, kill it all, be done with it. Sometimes that is the case. Some of you will inherit a landscape where the turf is just so eaten up with weeds, over 50% of that green out there in the yard is weeds. You may say, let's just kill it all and start over. Well, that would be a time to consider using a non-selective herbicide. More important things to remember. You have susceptible weeds, tolerant weeds, and resistant weeds. Susceptible means that the herbicide you selected will control that weed when applied properly. Tolerant weeds means that genetically, biologically, whatever herbicide you're applying doesn't really affect it. It has a natural resistance to it. But then you have resistant weeds that originally were not tolerant or resistant to it, but over application, over and over and over again, Finally, some of those weeds built up a resistance to it and therefore are no longer vulnerable to that herbicide. So you have susceptible, tolerant, and resistant. Timing, very important. Pre-emerge versus post-emerge. Pre-emerge simply means you apply it before the weed seed germinates. So that that chemical barrier that you've applied will inhibit the successful germination and development of that weed seed into a plant. That's before the problem occurs, before the weed germinates. Post-merge means, as the name implies, after the weed has already started growing. Ideally, when you apply post-merge, is when the seedling, weed seedling, is very, very young. The first two, three, four, six leaf stage, typically one application of a post-merge herbicide will kill it. But you let it get up and get some size to it and get some roots developed and start getting some storage capacity up, it often is going to take more than one application to get it under control. Here we go again. Some more important terms to be very familiar with. Contact versus systemic. Contact means it burns the foliage of that plant where it comes in contact with that plant tissue. However, systemic means that it works down through the vascular system of the plant, works through the system of the plant, systemic. It may inhibit the way it photosynthesizes energy from sunlight. It may cause the plant to burn up stored energy beyond its capacity to replace it. But in some form or fashion, it works through the system of the weed and kills it. Contact usually burns it down Systemic usually works through it. Contact usually works quicker. Systemic usually takes longer. Failure. By far and away, failure occurs due to application error or applicator error. Now, it can also be because of environmental conditions. The temperature. It rained. It was too hot. The plant didn't metabolize the material. It was too dry. No rain to activate the pre-emergent. So environmental conditions can influence it. By far and away, though, it's applicator error. Herbicide resistance, that won't occur in most cases except where you keep using the same product over and over and over again. The bottom line to all this is don't spray and pray. Don't depend on herbicides to do it all. Remember the IPM approach.
Look at the big three groups of weeds you have to deal with. In most of your references, they're going to talk about grassy weeds or grass-like weeds, and then they're going to talk about broadleaf weeds. Truth be known, there are three groups. You've got grasses, you've got broadleaf weeds, and you have sedges. Now let's look at the differences. Your grassy weeds typically are going to have hollow stems, parallel veins, and a very fibrous root system. You look at your, your broadleaf weeds, typically they're going to have net-like veins in the leaves. The leaves are going to be broad, typically round or roundish or elliptical. And they can have flowers, some interesting flowers. But let's look at sedges. Sedges, oh, excuse me. Yeah, and they can have uh, tap roots in some cases on your, your broadleaf weeds. But sedges have a triangular stem and ranked leaves, ranked foliage. What ranked means is on a triangle, as they're pushing up new foliage from the base, one comes up, then a little bit further up, the next one comes out, and then a little bit further up, the next one comes out. So they're ranked one above the other above the other as they push out. Triangular stem and ranked leaves are sedges. I know a lot of you know nut grass. Well, really, nut grass is not a grass. It is a sedge. The correct way to say it is nut sedge. Very important, annuals, biennials, and perennials. Annuals mean that that weed does everything it's going to do in one growing season. It's going to germinate, it's going to grow, it's going to produce seed, and it dies in one season. You have warm season annuals and you have cool season annuals. So let's look at this chart. Your summer annuals typically germinate in the spring of the year, grow through the summer, produce and die in the fall of the year as temperatures cool down, but they produce seed. Germinate in the spring, grow through the summer, produce seed and die in the fall of the year. Well, just the opposite of that are your winter annuals. They germinate in the fall of the year, grow through the mild periods of the winter, produce seed and die in the spring as temperatures warm up. So you've got annuals, which can be warm season annuals or cool season annuals. Then we get to the next level, biennials. Biennials means they live two years. Typically, they grow vegetatively the first year. They can form rosettes the first year. Just grow foliage, roots, storage capacity the first year. Then the second season comes around. They put up that flower head, that seed head, that seed spike, produce seed, and die. They live two years, biennial. Vegetative the first year, produce seed and die the second year. And then perennials. That means they live more than two years. And the thing about perennials isn't that they just live more than two years, but the whole time they're living, they're producing seed. And a lot of our perennials can reproduce also from plant parts. It can be rhizomes, it can be stolons, it can be tubers. They have all kinds of ways. So perennials don't only last more than two years, they can reproduce in many ways in most cases. Let's look at some examples of some weeds you need to be familiar with. Annual bluegrass. Well, that tells you right away. It's an annual, annual bluegrass. It, but it happens to be a winter annual. So please remember, it germinates in the fall, grows through the winter, produces seed and dies in the, in the spring. Typically, they produce these real dense little seed heads. It can look whitish or silvery, but they can produce seed very rapidly. They can be made, mowed very short, tolerate very close mowing, and can still produce some seed to come back and get you next year. They are drought sensitive. In other words, they will go off color, dormant, and possibly die during dry periods. But typically, is it dry during the winter and early spring? Usually it's not. So that's typically not a problem in our climate. The best way to deal with this, of course, is to put a pre-emerge out. Well, Think back, I said pre-emerge is before the weed successfully germinate. Well, if this typically germinates in the fall, when would you put the pre-emerge out? In the fall. You may see that a little bit later today. 
Crabgrass is just the opposite. It is a summer annual weed. It happens to be a grass. And there are different types of crabgrass. Don't get bogged down on this. There's large crabgrass, southern crabgrass, smooth crabgrass. There are quite a few others, as a matter of fact. But all in all, they are a summer annual grassy weed. They germinate in the spring and summer. And there's an important point to pause on here. Annual bluegrass and crabgrass, all their weed seed do not commit at the same time. In other words, just because it's April 15th, all the crabgrass seed has not germinated. Or just because it is November 1st, all the bluegrass seed has not committed to germinate. They germinate over a period of time. The point I'm trying to make is, and let's stick with crabgrass in this example, is almost everybody in here knows, well, you put out the crabgrass preventer in our area the end of February, usually, or sometime in early March. Well, I've just stood up here and said all the crabgrass seed doesn't necessarily commit itself in that, you know, that early spring time. Some of those seed are going to lay around, lay around a little while, and germinate later in the spring or early summer. So that is why some of you, when you put out your pre-emerge, you start seeing a little bit of crabgrass in the middle of the summer, and you're going, well, wait a minute. I put my pre-emerge out when, when I thought I was supposed to. Well, you can have outbreaks later. Your pre-emerge typically are going to give you protection around six to eight weeks. And as that breaks down, then some of this seed that hasn't tried to germinate can come back and haunt you later. And the same is true with annual bluegrass. So sometimes you're going to have to make second applications of the pre-emerge. Goosegrass is a warm season grass. It germinates when the temperatures are a little bit warmer. So it typically is going to wait until late spring or summer to germinate. It's got a very fibrous root system. It's got a very low growing pattern. It really hugs the ground, very open center. See how it's kind of whitish in the middle there? Some people call it silver crabgrass. But this is something that you're going to run into and it takes a little bit more, it takes a little bit different pre-emergent than crabgrass does. They're both warm season annual grasses, that's true. But you need to identify this. If it looks like crabgrass but you're not sure, you may want to key it out a little bit further, bring it by, let the, the county agent take a look at it and say whether it is crabgrass or goosegrass. And remember, the seed heads will help you out a lot. If you can get a seed head with the plant itself, it usually helps you identify it more exactly. Okay, so summing it up, managing annual grasses, of course, they can be difficult to control after they get established because they are a grass. So you need to be very careful in selecting a post-emergent herbicide to control them in a turf situation. Pre-emerge usually do the best job and commonly do a good job, but of course, occasionally you do have to call in a post-emergent. We know about putting out the pre-emergent, depending on what grassy weeds we're going after in the fall for things like annual bluegrass or in early spring for things like crabgrass. And when we talk about, oh, winter annuals, yeah, we already talked about that one. Dallas grass. Dallas grass happens to be a perennial. It means it lives more than two years. It ha technically, it's a warm season perennial. And it's very low growing. A lot of people will think, well, you know, it's a crabgrass, but it's just making this big clump and it doesn't go away in the winter. It, it turns brown, but that clump is still there. And it puts up these seed heads real fast. I'll go out there and mow it, and it seems like in three to five days I've got these seed heads coming up again. Well, Dallas grass is one of those that puts those seed heads up pretty quickly after you mow and it can take away, because they stand up so tall, they can take away from the attractiveness of a turf. But it's very clumping, very low to the ground. If you just have a clump or two of this in a, in a landscape, either hand removal, of course you may have to dig it out, or spot spray with a herbicide, but it will often take multiple applications because it is such a dense, tenacious perennial. Or if most of the lawn area that you're responsible for is Dallas grass, that's one of those times you may want to go ahead and kill everything and start over. So keep in mind, these are the hardest to control because, of course, they're similar to your other turf grasses, your, your fescues, your Bermudas, and so on. 
you got to pick the right post-emergent herbicide and you probably will have to make multiple applications. Let's look at sedges. Sedges, remember, have that triangular stem, three ranked leaves, and they form tubers and rhizomes. So you've got these storage tubers that they can come back from each year, and then you've got these little rhizomes that can go out and develop new plants. So it can cause more and more problems in a wider area. If you don't get it under control fairly quickly, it can keep expanding. And yes, this is one of those that you often bring in in some of your plant materials, some of your topsoils, some of your soil amendments. So be very careful about your source. Yellow and purple nut sedge are the primary ones that you have to deal with. There are other sedges, but typically these are the two. Your yellow nut sedge, if you were to dig this up, the tubers are usually fairly smooth, usually a tannish color, and if you're so prone to do so, you can bite it and it has a sweet flavor to it. I have not tasted a uh, nut sedge tuber. I have had a rattlesnake weed tuber before and that was actually pretty good. We'll get to that in a second. Purple nut sedge, the tubers are usually dark, very fibrous roots coming out of the tuber. And those tubers are usually interlinked. Now, those of you that don't have the opportunity to dig up the tubers and make that decision, and you notice, I mentioned yellow and purple nut sedge, you're going, Steve, why worry about which one? I'll just spray for nut sedge. Well, because some herbicides are more effective against yellow than purple, and some are more effective against purple than yellow. Point being, identify your weed, make the right selection of your herbicide, you'll get better control. Broadleaf weeds that you have to deal with, this happens to be a summer annual broadleaf weed, prostrate spurge. You're going to find it in some of the hottest parts of the landscape. You're going to find it where the soil is fairly compacted. It be, may be right up along the edge of the road where people have gone off the road and compacted the soil with a little bit of traffic and tire, tire, uh, excuse me, vehicle tires running over it. They do have tap roots, and one of the key ways to identify spurges is the milky sap when you break the stems. They can have small flowers and some spurges, and like other weeds we'll talk about in a second, some spurges, those seed pods that they form, you disturb them, they'll actually fire the seed out of those little pods. So you just merely touching them or brushing them, they'll send the seed scattering in different directions in your landscape. So of course you would like to deal with this with a pre-emerge first. If you knew you had that problem last year, You'd like to get that pre-emerge out before it starts germinating in the spring as the soil warms up. Common chickweed. Yes, a bunch of you are dealing with common chickweed right now. It's out there in the landscape. It is a winter annual weed. It is a broadleaf weed. And you can use pre-emerge to prevent it back in the fall or very early winter. But where it does come up, of course, there's some broadleaf herbicides that you can go in and selectively kill it out. But look at that little flower. It has a very succulent stem, has a heart-shaped leaf, but that little white flower, the petals on it have that little notch in it. It's called a cleft petal. Henbit, a lot of you are dealing with this right now too. Henbit is in the mint family, has a square stem, but look at the leaves on it. Look at the way the leaves grasp around that square stem. They aren't out on little petioles or little stems. They, the leaves themselves grip all the way around the stem. It has these beautiful little purple flowers. Of course, that's not pretty out, out in a dormant Bermuda lawn. Dandelions, another, this is a perennial broadleaf weed that you have to deal with. And of course, most of you are well aware that it has a very stout tap root. And when you pull, try and hand remove it, you leave a little piece, it often will regenerate from that small piece that you leave in the ground. But it can also re reproduce not only from plant parts, but it can reproduce from seed. Plantain is a perennial broadleaf that you have to deal with. Typically it forms a rosette, fairly open and prostrate to the ground. Some forms are a little more upright. The two examples here are broadleaf plantain and buckhorn plantain. Notice the five parallel veins 
and you can see it a little more readily in the upper image. If you look at the leaf, it has five parallel veins coming out through the stem, out towards the tip end of the leaf. Clovers. Most of your clovers are perennial. There are some annual clovers, but in our case, we're going to talk about white clover and red clover. They can reproduce from seed, but they're perennial and they form stolons running out across the ground. They try and spread. And they have trifoliate leaves. Most of them are three-leaf clovers. Wild garlic can really be a pain because it is a perennial. It can reproduce from the bulbs in the ground. It can reproduce from the bulbs, aerial bulbs or bulblets that get scattered. Now, when do you typically notice these in a landscape? You typically notice them in your dormant, warm season grasses. You normally start noticing them in November and February. That's just somehow they seem to show up more. Well, they have to be a cool season perennial. So when it gets hot, they die back down and just kind of hang out until next November when they come up again. Well, when would you treat for these? Well, since you already have them, typically you're going to treat for them in November and February when they typically are most active. So keep in mind that when you manage winter annuals and perennial broadleaf weeds, you can use a selective post-emergent herbicide mid-fall or early winter, or you can use a selective post-emergent herbicide in mid to late spring. It just depends on which weeds you're dealing with. So we're in the home stretch here. Remember, develop a weed management program. You want to identify the weeds, the desirable plant material, then make your selection of a herbicide. Understand the life cycle of the weed. Is it an annual, a biennial, or a perennial? Try to avoid the problem through proper site preparation. In some cases, you need to kill everything with a non-selective herbicide before you make that flower bed, that shrub bed. In extreme cases, you might fumigate, but we're not going to go there. Of course, apply the correct fertilizer and soil amendments for those annuals or perennials that you'll be putting out in the landscape. And space the plants to be competitive with the weeds. That doesn't mean jam plants together. Just know what size the plants need to grow to and then space them out accordingly. And there's some other cultural practices that we're going to talk about in a second. But don't forget, put the right plant in the right location so that it grows robustly. Site maintenance. Of course, when you just have a few weeds, hand removal is the most practical thing to do. But don't overlook the value of mulching. Two to four inches of mulch, that'll be on your test, two to four inches of mulch typically will help inhibit weed seed from successfully germinating. Doesn't mean you won't have weeds. It just means you've got a layer of protection out there to reduce the weed problems. In other cases, you may choose to use landscape fabric. But landscape fabric isn't perfect. Typically, landscape fabric gives you two to three years of good weed control. But over time, as the organic layer on top starts breaking down, you form that compost soil-like layer on top of the fabric. And if your mulch has gotten thin, seed can drop down, germinate, and root right through that landscape fabric. So it will give you some advantage, but it can break down over time. Obviously, you want to be careful with your non-selected herbicides, because here again, if it gets blown over on your desirable flowers or your desirable shrubs, you can injure them. Pre-emergent herbicides go a long ways in ornamental sit settings to reduce weed problems to begin with, just like in your turf. Put it out before your weed problem occurs. And occasionally you will have to call in some post-emergent herbicides to help clean up some of your flower beds and shrub beds. Some weeds that you need to be familiar with. Sand spur is a summer annual weed. Sand spur is a grass. And it, what makes it so bad, and the reason you want to put the pre-emerge out is because you don't want this out there in your turf, you don't want this in your flower beds, because as the name implies, it forms these spurs, these seed pods with these great big barbs on them, which are very uncomfortable when you come in contact with them. Bermuda grass, you're going, well, wait a minute, Bermuda grass is a, a good turf. Yeah, Bermuda grass can be a very good turf, but when it's over in your flower bed or your shrub bed, it becomes a weed. 
And what makes it so difficult is it's a perennial. Well, it can produce seed, remember? It can produce seed. It has rhizomes which run underground. It has stolons that run above ground. So some form or fashion, it's going to try and reproduce. It's going to try and cover more and more area in your flower beds and your shrub beds. So it can be a challenge. And when you pull it out, if you're trying to hand remove it, remember, any little pieces you leave potentially can regenerate. So you want to do a thorough job if you're hand removing. You want to use selective herbicides. There are some grass herbicides clearly labeled to control grass in ornamental beds and flower beds. So you may be doing over top sprays. You may be doing directional sprays. Carolina geranium, or some people call it cranesbill or wild geranium. Typically, these are roundish leaves, but they have very deep lobes in those leaves. They do have purple or pink flowers, and the seed pods themselves, hence one of the common names, look like a crane's bill. You can hand remove these. A good mulch layer, two to four inches deep, can inhibit them, and occasionally you'll go out there and spot spray with herbicides. Horseweed is a summer annual. Oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Of course, don't forget, Carolina geranium is a cool season annual. Horseweed is a summer annual. Of course, it can put out these flower heads, can get quite tall. And of course, when you let these seed heads develop, they form all this seed to be scattered out across your landscape and come back and haunt you later. But hand removal is practical in a lot of cases. Broadleaf weed herbicides can help depending on the setting. Bull thistle is an example of a biennial. Remember, biennial, grow vegetatively the first year, produce seed, and die the second year. This forms the rosette you see here the first year. Flat to the ground, typically. Not totally flat, but fairly close to the ground. But then the second year, it forms this seed head. The flowers are beautiful, but you don't want to handle them because they have tremendous thorns all over them. So if you do decide to hand pull them, remember to wear some very thick gloves. Wood sorrel is a perennial. Some of you know it by the term oxalis. Yes, there are some oxalis in the ornamental trade, but in this case, it's typically a weed in your flower beds. Those of you that grow container plants, it can be a weed in your containers too. This forms one of those seed pods I was talking about that will fire off the seed and cast them a great distance away from the original plant. It has little yellow flowers, trifoliate leaves, but these trifoliate leaves are more heart-shaped. And as they creep and crawl across the ground, they can root down at each node. Florida betony. Now this is one of those weeds, if you just wanted to, you can eat the tubers. But these tubers are interlinked. And they're very white. And they have constrictions on them. The plant itself above ground has a square stem. It also has these pretty pinkish purple flowers. But where it gets its name, of course, con uh, excuse me, the proper name is Florida betony, but a lot of people call it rattlesnake weed. And the reason it's called rattlesnake weed is because of the constrictions on the tuber you see uh, up here on the screen. Those tubers are edible, by the way. But what makes it such a problem is it just creeps and crawls through your flower beds and just keeps coming up because those tubers are a huge storage capacity. You want to stay on top of these and remove them as soon as you can and spot spray as needed. And keep your mulch the proper depth. Just the last few that I need to go through. Dock is a perennial. Curly leaf dock, broadleaf dock, these form rosettes, but they're perennial, so they live more than two years. They have a very tenacious taproot. You'll be amazed at how large those taproots can be if you try and dig them out. But just like some other weeds, if you try and pull it up and you don't get almost every bit of the taproot, they can regenerate and come back. And I believe we're in the home stretch here, poison ivy. Poison ivy out in the woods, you know, we're, we're all familiar with that, and we all are very careful with that. Great fall color. Wildlife loves it. Has little flowers that are kind of inconspicuous. But then it forms this fruit, and this fruit is very attractive to birds. And it's so attractive to birds, they can't resist it. They eat it. Then they come over to your yard, and they pass the seed, and you have poison ivy growing out around your landscape. 
So keep this in mind. Of course, we all know that poison ivy can cause skin irritation. It has leaves of three. They're very glossy green leaves. They can be somewhat attractive, but it spreads by seed and it spreads by rhizomes. And that wraps up my portion of Category 24, 